Hey guys, it's Jacob from Living Healthy Every Day, and we've got a cool podcast for you. Today, we're going to be discussing fluoride, fake estrogens as endocrine disruptors, where they're hidden, and some actions you can take to prevent the damage to your body caused by them. So, I'm here with Dr. Anthony J. Thanks for being here, Dr. J. Thanks for having me. This is good. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. J is a scientist and the head of AJ Consulting Company, where he predominantly analyzes DNA for high-performing individuals. He is the president of the International Medical Research Collaborative, a 501 nonprofit organization that trains and educates medical students and doctors from around the globe within American hospitals and labs. He is also an expert on artificial estrogen chemicals and recently published Estrogeneration amazing book and uh he has his own youtube channel podcast and he's also a fisherman yeah (laughs) so it's busy (laughs) he's uh he's got some cool stuff going on for him so without further ado let's get started so let's first talk about the water supply and how it's contributing to our health problems absolutely so it's interesting that you brought up fluoride because most people don't usually discuss fluoride it's contentious topic right well where's where's it found it's it's normally found in our toothpaste and yeah, it's. I mean, it's yeah. really high levels. It's a. It's you know, I consider it almost dangerously high, depending on how many times you brush your teeth a day, assuming you brush at least a couple times a day. And there's always a difference between children and adults, right? Because you know, children are more sensitive to fluoride and other yeah. chemicals. We're going to talk about later these endocrine endocrine disrupting chemicals. Yeah. But. You know, I mean, there's a lot of research. I don't know if you, how much you want to get into it, but with, in terms of the fluoride, you know, there was there was a lot of research that came out in the 80s that suggested it was healthy for your teeth. But, you know, we've gone back and done those same research studies in the lab and f- essentially debunked them. Mm-hmm. They, they showed that I think it was 10 parts per million. OK, they, they did it. I did a YouTube video. I don't know if you saw this video on this, but uh they they took out some teeth from cows and they soaked them in acid all right so obviously not in the natural environment of teeth but let's just you know let's just assume that's a good experiment and they be just to, just to speed up the degradation and they added 10 parts per million of fluoride and this is back in i don't know 1984 and they showed that the 10 parts per million protected those cows teeth from degradation a little bit and and they used x-rays yeah they they used x-rays to to kind of quantify that they x-rayed the teeth but now we've gone back and done that experiment just recently and not only did it not hold up they used up to five thousand parts per million fluoride and basically the same experiment except they didn't use x-rays this time they quantified it by white light inferometry they used a more uh, fine-tuned technique, you know, a better better technology to measure degradation. Otherwise, the experiment was the same, and they went way above 10 parts per million, 5,000 parts per million, yeah. and they found no difference with or without fluoride in protection. So even in that, even in that kind of ridiculous experiment, which is so the first one, did so they have a control? Well, I'm sorry. Did the first one have a control? Oh yeah, the control is just uh, no fluoride, right? So you just you just put them in acid without the fluoride and then you just compare them the the ones with with or without fluoride and you know the toothpaste for people to just kind of get a sense of where we are in our fluoride it's a it's above 1000 it's usually 1500 parts per million and the toxic level in humans if you're if it's in your drinking water and it goes above 10 parts per million uh, excuse me one part per million it's considered toxic but that's wow. drinking it right i mean you're not drinking your toothpaste but the problem is if you're swallowing one thousandth of your toothpaste literally you're putting you're setting yourself up so in the kind of toothpaste pox- left on your teeth after brushing your teeth that's right and, and just think about the kids right i mean kids do not spit out much of their toothpaste yeah. and they've found so many significant health problems from that they you know muscle problems brain problems so i what's mean it, what's it doing in the muscle in the brain uh i mean I'm not totally sure, you know, about the exactly what's going on. I, I know there's a long list of problems and, you know, <laughs> I, I think I, I think it uh, it disrupts a lot of things. It disrupts signaling, you know, and it and it disrupts uh, 
you know, some of the electrical signaling, not just biochemical signaling. Yeah, I, I know yep. it, it disrupts a lot, yeah, a lot of the electromagnetic signaling uh, yep. and also circadian rhythm, which is really funny w- that we do it right before going to sleep. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I used to use fluoride and it's interesting because when I started looking into this, actually my brother got me going on it. He's, he asked, asked me, should I have fluoride for my kids? And I said, well, let me go into the scientific literature and start researching it. And I couldn't believe, I mean, I'm not, I'm not the world's most foremost expert on fluoride, but I, you know, I'm a biochemist, a PhD, I can do, you know, I can go through the research and I went through it and I was, I was like, man, I'm not using it myself. (laughs) And certainly not for my kids. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's too bad because people don't usually hear about this. And when they do hear about it, it's kind of couched in this idea that it's super contentious and it's a really debated topic. But man, you know, if you go through the research, it's, there's no benefit. Number one, there's no benefit. And, and yeah, you can find maybe one study here that shows a benefit, but then you you can also find one study here that shows there's no benefit. You know, there's always like an opposing study, you know, and the benefits are pretty negligible, even in the studies that supposedly find benefits. So yeah. there's no benefit. And then you look at the toxicity. And like I say, the list is just a laundry list in terms of your hormones. Like you say, circadian rhythms, that's really interesting. And yeah, and, so yeah when, just, when you go to the dentist, you don't want to get fluoride. At the, no, the absolutely. End yeah, yeah, I tell people for sure. And yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> it's, I mean, I don't even know what levels they're giving people. 5,000 parts per million, maybe 10,000. Yeah, they tell you not to eat after or drink anything. I'm sure it's because of that. Yeah, it's a trace mineral. So, you know, getting a little tiny bit in your tea or in your food, you know, you know, and I talk a lot about healthy soil because that's another big problem in America. We definitely have problems with our soil and we continue to deplete the nutrients and just keep putting nitrogen fertilizer back on it, but you know, deplete all these essential nutrients. And so there there is kind of a lack of some of these you know, trace minerals that we should be having. And sometimes we don't. And I know we're going to talk about testosterone later, but I'll throw something in there right now. Um, Manganese is is deficient in a lot of people. Tim Ferriss even wrote about this in his book, uh, The 4-Hour Body. And manganese brings your testosterone up if you're deficient in it. And a lot of people are deficient because, like I say, the soils are so poor. So, yeah. There's a lot of issues. You I don't know. know. I've seen conflicting studies about manganese. Maybe it's not in deficiency, but overabundance uh, contributing to beta amyloid plaques and Alzheimer's disease. It's a good point. Yeah. Well, so the manganese is interesting. It's unique because with as far as the testosterone goes, it raises your testosterone. So if you're deficient in it, again, but if you continue to have like zinc, zinc does the same oh yeah yeah all those enzymes that are involved with uh, the production of testosterone from cholesterol but if you continue to have manganese just you know for long periods of time then it actually drops your testosterone and i I actually did a youtube video on this because i was so surprised by it because you know it's people use it as a strategy they eat brazil nuts or they eat some kind of a nut that has high manganese and you can get a temporary spike, but if you continue to do that, supplement whatever form of, you know, some kind of natural substance like a nut or, you know, some food item or a vitamin, you'll actually bring it down. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So uh, once so I found that, that, I said, I got a bell curve there. Yeah. <laughs> where, where it's, where it's okay. <laughs> and most people, obviously that's not their goal. You know, if they're trying to bring their testosterone up, you really got to be careful. I mean, in the, when the hormone world, it, there's always this, this balance between, you know, bringing whatever hormone, usually it's testosterone, bringing it up. And then, you know, if you continue to keep it up high, it, a lot of times the receptors will, uh, you know, downregulate, they'll have actually less receptors. Mm -hmm. And so you have to continue to bring it up or ideally you just cycle the hormone or not the hormone, but the supplement. It's your body trying to keep its own homeostasis, which makes sense. That's right. Yeah. So what is going on with these hormones? Why are they being disrupted? Let's get a little into that. Your, uh, your book, Estrogeneration. Uh, what are estrogenics? What the, what the basics yeah. of it? Yeah. Estrogenics are essentially any, any chemical that acts on the estrogen receptor. Mm-hmm. And estrogen receptor is interesting because it's found in virtually every cell in your body. 
So a lot of receptors aren't found in every cell in your body. For example, leptin is a, you know, is a hormone that your fat cells secrete. And there's, you know, so it goes into your blood and leptin's traveling around in your blood. But most of the cells in your body don't have leptin receptors. So they don't pick it up. Your brain has leptin receptors. So when it gets to your brain, right? So like say it goes through your muscles, nothing happens, right? It just go, it yeah. just comes in and goes out. But when it actually gets into your brain, it's you've got receptors in there that grab onto it, and then it tells your brain, "I'm full. Stop eating." Right? Yeah. And whereas estrogen is unique because you've got estrogen receptors in your muscles, you've got estrogen receptors in your brain, you've got them all over your body. It's amazing how you know highly expressed they are, or thoroughly expressed they are in your body. So when they're, you start, they're actually one of the first receptors that like uh, animals ever had. Uh, oh, wow. You can trace them back Evolution. to mollusks. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it makes it makes sense because, like I say, you see so much global distribution in, in your in humans, but also in other animals. I mean, that's why you see reproductive problems with fish and with frogs and, you know, all these other animals, polar bears even. Right. And yeah. so these these disruptions you know so we so what i did with my book is i i compiled a top 10 list of artificial estrogen the so that irs sense. 10 list yeah yeah i called yeah. it the irs 10 just to kind of just to, <laughs> i love just, the name. that's just my style <laughs> <laughs> and irs stand in my book i i kind of denote that means uh the ill reproductive system list so obviously i'm not talking about the government oh, nice. <laughs> although it is a little bit of a jab but um, because because these artificial estrogens, I mean, that's one of the biggest problems with them is they destroy people's, they destroy or alter or, like I say, just disrupt people's uh, reproduction because, you know, I mean, this is a sex hormone, stero uh, estrogen and testosterone are sex hormones. And by the way, uh, testosterone and estrogen both travel on SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin. So you've got this protein that goes throughout your blood. So estrogen and testosterone they're they're fatty right they they act like they're they're like cholesterol or lipids or oils they float on water and your blood acts like water right so if you put these hormones into your blood they would just float on the top obviously that's not good for you know getting a hormone throughout your body so you've got and i know you know this i'm just kind of maybe reiterating this for your listeners but yeah, so this SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin, I call it the limo service for hormones because, you know, they go in there and that trucks them around, that trout that gets them around your blood without, you know, without having them float. So it's a big protein. It's a big sugary protein, glycoprotein. And so that's when people talk about total testosterone or total estrogen and free testosterone or free estrogen. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about the total being just everything that's there and then the free is the stuff that's outside of that limo it's outside of the that's shpg yeah. yeah and and so that's obviously an important number and the reason i kind of went down that rabbit hole maybe a little bit is because artificial estrogens these this top 10 irs 10 list that i created and you know i've done a lot of research on they lower your total testosterone and your free testosterone they disrupt that you know that shbg process because you know they, they mimic estrogen. They're not allowing testosterone to bind or float around. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they, they, so essentially, with, especially with the estrogenics, these, these chemicals that act on the estrogen receptor, I like to, when I started looking into them, you know, I, I think the first thing that I, got, I kind of got tipped off to is fat gains. You know, they cause some the weight gains because when your body is pregnant or when a woman's body is pregnant, uh, you know, they, they tend, estrogen increases and that causes their body to store a little bit more fat because, you know, if they go into starvation mode, obviously, which doesn't really happen anymore these days, but, you know, the body doesn't know that. And, and so it, it, it retains a little bit of extra fat in case the baby needs it, in case there's an emergency situation because fat is the most dense form of energy. And that's what got me going on this was, I think, you know, these artificial estrogens, they also cause fat gains and, you know, and not to mention the, uh, the epigenetics, which we should probably talk about later at some point. Well, yeah. The epigenetic, uh, effects of estrogen, estrogenics yeah. through generations. Yeah. And that's what got me going on it. I think is, is, you know, I started researching it in the, with the, with the thought that, 
you know, this is a disruption. Just think of pregnancy, right? You see some depression, you see hormone changes. So that can cause things like depression. Obviously, like I say, weight gains. You see, you know, some blood clotting issues, obviously lower testosterone, but that's, you know, you see immune system dysregulation. And, and because, you know, again, think about pregnancy. So if a woman has a baby inside, the your body can't perceive that as you know, an invading organism. You have to shut your immune system down to some degree. And, you know, but you still have to fight infection, maybe even more so than ever. And so scientists say that natural estrogen, not artificial, but natural estrogen is immunostimulative and immunosuppressive. Right, which... Yeah, which is obviously kind of conflicting, but that's the way it is. I mean, that's what they find and they don't understand it, but they can tell you that's what happens. and, And... that's where these artificial estrogens come in they you know a lot of them are considered immunotoxic and so it's because they're disrupting that natural fine-tuned delicate balance with these natural estrogens especially like i say if you're thinking about in terms of pregnancy you can start seeing the how these things fit together right so let's let's uh let's go through your irs 10 list real quick um let's start with the natural ones Okay, good. Yeah, so yeah, so phytoestrogen, plant estrogens, and uh, mold estrogens called mycoestrogens. Those are probably, I think those are the two, yeah, those are the only two that are found in nature. And they're, you know, they're prevalent. I think, you know, humans have been exposed to some, to both of those, mycoestrogens and phytoestrogens for eons. But recently, because of the processing with soy and you know, even flax, you know, we're processing flax and purifying it and distilling it and all this stuff. And then mycoestrogen with the mold, we're storing our grains in these huge silos. And, you know, we're, we're ending up with a lot of mold and we're not regulating it properly in America, at least. And, and that's a whole other problem. But, you know, so we're getting exposed to a lot more of these quote unquote natural estrogens than we should be. Our body can, you know, handle a little bit of them. But, you know, people sim- sometimes they say, you know, well, it's hormetic stress, right? It's it's okay to kind of challenge your body a little bit. But when you're talking about hormones, I'm not so sure that's true. Because when you're disrupting your, you know, you're that fine balance with your hormones, especially when you're talking about infertility, right? I mean, there's no such thing as, you know, a little bit of infertility is okay for you, right? Like if you, if you, if you're trying to get pregnant or whatever, or you, you don't even, or when you start talking about epigenetics mm-hmm. and future generations. By the way, so uh, listeners know what, hormesis is it's adding a little bit of stress to the body for it to build up uh, a tolerance to it kind of of like exercise yeah exactly yeah and some of these some some, you know in most cases that's a good thing like sun you get outside you get a little bit of a sun not a sunburn but yeah you know you get a little challenge on to your body and that your body adapts and it gets stronger Mm -hmm. but man you start doing that with these artificial estrogens and and, and any endocrine disrupting chemicals, really. I think if, that's if one of the reasons. At, like the Okinawans, they, they eat a lot of soy. Um, so what's going on there? Is it good. Their, their gut bacteria? Well, um, for one, they're, you know, they live longer, right? In Japan, they, they have about a four or five uh, year lifespan difference than Americans. But that's been steadily decreasing. So that's that's the first point is I think they're becoming more and more unhealthy. But the reason uh, I think the reason they're healthy is because they're a little bit more healthy. I mean, is because, number one, they eat a lot of seafood and fish and that's got a lot of DHA and that covers up for a lot of these problems. In fact, I've even got a study towards the end of my book about how DHA or omega three fatty acids can somehow buffer the effects of. Uh, these artificial estrogens and we don't understand how or why but they do and I mean it's just another thing right these omega-3s especially DHA it's just everything that you study it seems like shows that DHA is amazing it doesn't matter what it is (laughs) I haven't seen any negative studies about DHA (laughs) yeah it's amazing I've done I've published peer-reviewed papers myself on DHA and you know I found it to be excellent the only problem I see is when it becomes oxidized but that's with any fat that's true that's true that's true of any yep yep um but, but I was going to say, I mean, the, the unique thing about the Asians in terms of the soy products is they ferment a lot of their soy naturally. So like their soy sauce is fermented, is actually fermented, not 
pretend fermented with some kind of an artificial processing you know facility where they mimic fermentation but they don't actually do it because fermentation breaks down these phytoestrogens and uh so almost any substance that you see over in asia where they're eating you know eating some soy product it's almost always fermented and that makes a difference yeah i i, I like that that theory there what about something like resveratrol which acts on the estrogen receptor um I, that's another yeah i've never done estrogen. i haven't done a lot of research into resveratrol because uh i mean it's it's interesting because it acts yeah, on sirtuin has a ton of benefits too. yeah exactly that's what i was gonna say so oh, yeah. it acts on a protein called sirtuin a lot of scientists just call it sirt s-i-r-t yep and so it's that pathway is amazing because it's involved in a huge number of events inside the cell and especially anti-aging type stuff. But I think I think a lot of the I mean, the resveratrol is interesting because we don't get that much of it from red wine or from tomatoes or whatever. We're not you know, you almost have to supplement it. Yeah. And, 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 and it actually soy is is it's a, I'm glad you brought up uh, resveratrol because, again, I haven't done a lot of research on it, but phytoestrogens are interesting in that in that same regard because they do have positive benefits but i think the disruption of the estrogen receptor system it, at least in the case of phytoestrogens is it, it it's overpoweringly negative it's too negative to try and to try and justify the benefit the quote-unquote benefits but resveratrol might be different because I don't think it's as estrogenic. It doesn't bind. You know, there's different degrees on how tightly something binds an estrogen receptor. Mm -hmm. You've got and that's types one of, of the, estrogen receptors as well that have different. That's functions. right. Yeah. 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 Alpha, beta. Yeah. Alpha, beta, nuclear membrane receptors. Yeah. 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 And, and, and one of the things about a lot of these estrogens that we're going to come up on on this top 10 list is there's different variations. So let me just throw an example, get ahead of myself a little bit. So, uh, parabens right sometimes you read a scientific paper and it says parabens are quote unquote weakly estrogenic like they're barely estrogenic so that's no so that's no big deal we don't have to worry about parabens the problem is there's methylparaben there's propylparaben there's butylparaben right you could just go on and on and on so yeah you, yeah you can maybe pick out one of them and find that it's weakly estrogenic but you know it so it can vary based on you know these molecular shapes and the phyto the natural estrogens that you find uh, and, and by the way, I probably should bring up lavender and marijuana, which are also natural estrogens. Now, is and, it marijuana itself or is it what it's sprayed with? Uh, I think it's the cannabis itself because uh, people that smoke. It's a good question, actually. I mean, that's yeah, a huge because the endocannabinoid system has a plethora of benefits. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. cannabinoids in general. I mean, the research on both of those, the thing about the lavender and the uh, marijuana is there's so, so little research. There's, they're finding that it's estrogenic. It activates the estrogen receptor system, but they don't, they haven't done a thorough analysis. They haven't, you know, like you say, they haven't found the specific, whereas with soy, they know exactly, you know, it's these lignans and it's these, uh, you know, uh, isoflavones, you know, they know exactly what the estrogenic components are and you know, with marijuana and lavender, it's not known. But again, that's another example, especially with the, the well, with both lavender and marijuana, because lavender is anti-inflammatory. So you get some benefits, right? And then there's the estrogenic component. So I think a lot of times, at least with the natural ones, especially if you have good gut bacteria, that that can make up for, you know, most of the problems with these quote unquote yeah, natural. Fermenting except, except naturally in your body. It, yeah, exactly. Our bodies have seen these these bacteria have seen these chemicals before they know how to break them down and protect you I mean, it's symbiotic. yeah yeah whereas that's that's the problem with the artificial ones and that's yeah. why i focus on those usually because you've never seen those yeah, and before and, we get into the artificial ones let's talk about a little bit about mold oh yeah yeah so i mean that's wh what's in mold that's est estrogenic so there's only one chemical in mold a lot of people get this wrong but you know scientists say there's one mycoestrogen and it's called xerolenone. So it's Z-E-A usually, uh, xerolenone. And that's, there's plenty of mold toxins, right? And xerolenone, by the way, is a mold toxin. It's considered toxic. It's estrogenic. It, it disrupts your estrogen system, your testosterone, all that. But, you know, it's not like there's a long list of uh, mycoestrogens. There's just that one. There is, like I say, other mycotoxins like aflatoxin, ochratoxin, whatever. 
and those are also nasty for you. I'm not saying those are good, but but yeah, just that one from the from the mold. Yeah, and that gets into the meat while they they eat. Uh, I know it, it's in hay, right? And so it's a good point. Yeah, yeah, you got it. In the, eat it in the moldy hay. Meat. You get it in the moldy grains like the corn. I mean, there's so many problems with corn fed animals, you know, I mean, yeah, if you just look at it, right, you go to the store and you buy grass fed ground beef compared to grass and then you just slap it down on the countertop and you look at it. I mean, the stuff is like red and bloody. That's natural. And then you look at the, you know, the pale <laughs> corn fed stuff and it just looks sickly. Yeah. It, but it's unfortunate because the price is so different. But yeah, they're eating a ton of mold in those grains, and and frequently when the grains don't, uh, you know, pass the inspection in terms of the mold, they send it on to the cattle, and then it ends up in their blood. And so you know, instead I mean, of us levels, eating it directly, we eat it through an animal. Yeah, that's right. And it even, in fact, it even ends up in the milk. So you know, people that do a lot of dairy wow. from these grain-fed animals, you know. It can yeah. be difficult because they, they've they done studies. I'm sure you remember this study from my book because I spent a lot of time on it um, where people that drink just standard grocery store whole milk within one hour, you see a 17% decrease in testosterone in men. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously that's going to come with a lot of health problems. You know, that just lowering your testosterone in any way, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, is associated with a lot of test, uh, a lot of health problems, especially if we're already chronically low, which most Americans are. Yeah. Well, actually, let's talk about that level real quick. What should the testosterone yep. level be? Because the studies are flawed, and it seems like normal ranges don't know how to look for the uh, healthy range. They're looking at the, yeah. the broad spectrum of the sick and the normal. Yeah, yeah, it's completely off because Americans are <laughs> completely off. I mean, Americans, you know, the standard American is obviously unhealthy. One third of us in America are obese, uh, not just overweight, but technically obese, you know. And so we're already talking about low testosterone just from obesity, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe we get the low testosterone and then we get the obesity. I don't know. Well, you know, well, which one's funny because that. I, like you mentioned in your book is a endocrine um organ it's an endocrine That's organ yeah organ yeah <laughs> so it's producing yeah, and, all these it could produce all these effects right but testosterone lowering testosterone can also increase fat so it's like i say it's a chicken or egg situation with that but yeah. but one thing is for sure americans are unhealthy and we're basing all of our normal ranges, and that includes vitamin D, by the way, and a lot of these other things. We're basing the normal range on normal Americans, average Americans. And I mean, that is obviously a problem when, you know, especially when you look at testosterone, because we're sitting around, we're inside, we're not exercising, we're obese, we're eating chemical processed foods, we're eating artificial estrogens, which are lowering the test. I mean, there's so many things. We have mineral deficiencies like magnesium. I mean, oh man right i mean zinc like we talked about all these other yeah. trace minerals ah so you know the art yeah so the normal range is like you're asking i think usually when you're i mean it depends if you're a man or a woman or whatever but i would just look at the range chart that they give you and try and aim for the high end of the chart whatever that is because that's that's pretty much where you should be so i think for our for a man that's about 30 which is me i would you know i would fall into the category somewhere between 20 and uh, 20 200 sorry 200 <laughs> and 800 yeah so somewhere in there like quest there that would do that yeah yeah exactly most of the labs would give you that range and i'm trying to think the units would probably be nanograms per deciliter there or maybe nanograms per liter but uh whatever is 200 to 800 and so, if, you know, the way I think about it is I want to be above 500. I want to be somewhere up around 800. And it, and you can just tell. You don't need a doctor to tell you. You can tell you feel better. You know, you feel stronger. You feel more energy. And that's a yeah. good indicator, right? You don't. You shouldn't have to go to a scientific study and try and try and find some information on it. It's when like, you, it's when like you just know. Hormone. You know it's, you, yeah. you know it's yeah. right when you feel well. When energy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so yeah. I think that's a good way to do it because obviously it differs based on your age and all these other things. But usually if you eliminate your artificial estrogens and you exercise and you you know you make sure that your diet your diet is kind of 
you know, in, in tune with what it should be with nature, you know, you're getting your minerals and all that. You'll, you'll hit the high range. You don't, you, you don't need to do too much extra, you know, too many extra things, especially like I say, exercise, lift heavy. And you can bring that up, but avoiding yeah, the artificial training. resistance training. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. but avoiding artificial estrogens is an overlooked aspect that most people forget. And it's a huge aspect. I mean, like I said, just the whole milk, a 17% drop. I mean, that's a pretty, cause it, like, so that's if crazy. you think if you just had a 10% drop, yeah, if you're at 500 and you drop a 10% and you're down to 450, I mean, that's a pretty big drop. Yeah. And that's just, like I say, that's just a little bit of milk and you start doing that three times a day and you add some cheese and, you know, I mean, who knows what the other products that we have, all these other artificial estrogens, who, you know, you start adding those all together and you see a real substantial problem. Yeah, it's a, it's an epidemic. Let's, let's go to the, the other, the, the synthetic ones now. Okay, good. Yeah. So, synthetic estrogenics. so thankfully I got the list printed out here. <laughs> I always cool. print it out because, uh. I, I forget that you know the, all the specific ones. <laughs> well, maybe so, we could start with atrazine. Yeah, perfect. Sounds like you got the list also. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, so atrazine. I'm glad you were, you're going to go with that one next because I was going to go with that one next because uh, it, it flows well off the mycoestrogen, right? So you've got these grains. We're storing them in silos, and in America we don't regulate mycoestrogen, mold estrogen. Whereas in Europe they actually do. So in I know I'm going back a step for a second, but in Europe they only allow a certain amount of xerolino and mycoestrogen and they allow a little bit more for cattle grains and a lot less for human consumption but they but they have a regulation on it they have a limit in america we don't have a limit on mycoestrogen and the same is true of atrazine you know there's no there's no limit on it in terms of the food and the water and in in europe Totally illegal. Atrazine, totally illegal. They don't even let you use it over there because it's so problematic. Wow. It's it's estrogenic. It's insane, I think. And it's the second most used herbicide in North America. Apart from glyphosate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah after glyphosate, exactly. And that's screwing up people's gut bacteria. But uh, that's a little bit off topic because, you know. Life, at least glyphosate. Oh, it's got its own other. <laughs> yeah, that's at least you're not disrupting your estrogen. Yeah. We're, but atrazine, let me give you maybe a number. So uh, cows that eat grain right which of course there's corn which they're spraying atrazine on um i'm just going to verify but it's yeah it's in the blood samples they took blood samples from corn fed cows 700,000 nanograms per uh, liter nanograms per liter in the cow blood 700,000 not 70 not 700 not even 7,000 700,000 and that's that's atrazine i mean so in other words we're eating it in these corn-fed animals, we're certainly getting it from non-organic corn-fed, pro you know, corn products like tortillas or chips or whatever. I mean, people eat chips all the time, right? And they're not buying organic chips. I, I mean, and they don't know. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, people are idiots. I'm just saying, like, there's not a lot of awareness. Yeah, they're not doing it on purpose. Yeah, there's, there's just, yeah. people aren't talking about it because it's not even seen as a problem. Whereas, Two, let me give you another number just as a reference. 200 nanograms per liter disrupts frog reproduction. It just totally destroys the reproductive organs. 200. And in the cow blood, we're talking about 700,000 nanograms per liter. So, and again, the natural levels. I mean, we talked babies. about. <laughs> yeah, and well, some of them aren't, and, and the farmers know that. And that's why they feed them corn right before they slaughter them. But a lot of them, you know, when they're trying to have cattle reproduction, they're more careful about it with the ones that they want to reproduce. But when they ship them off to these huge slaughterhouses, yeah, they're, you know, they're infertile. If you were to take them out of that slaughterhouse situation, you know, after feeding them corn for a couple of weeks and all those antibiotics and all that other stuff, and then you put them back, yeah, they'd be infertile a lot of the time. And they're certainly fatter, you know, and that fat is, is the worst. That's where it's really bad. You know, you talk about the blood, but the fat, is they store artificial they store a lot more of these chemicals in their fat so that's atrazine <laughs> that's well, a lot of you find it you can find it like pretty much it gets into runoff right and it gets into our water supply good point yeah i forgot to mention you know it's it's absolutely in the water um again i think let me check the numbers but yeah we got seventeen thousand nanograms per liter in a lot of our water that's been tested and I mean, that's th that's kind of the interesting thing in America. We've got, you know, a lot of water supply issues and Europe doesn't have that with with that particular chemical atrazine. But 
you know, obviously if you come into a city like Boston, like Miami, whatever, there's probably not that much atrazine in the water unless they're spraying on golf courses or lawns or whatever, which, you know, they are in a lot of cases, but you find birth control in the water there because, you know, your body doesn't break that. Women's bodies don't break that down. It's specifically designed to, you know, to withstand your liver and all this. So you end up peeing out most of that birth control hormone and that goes into the water supply and we don't filter that out. And the studies are real clear on that. So we've got this double, this two edged sword, you know, this two pronged problem where if you live out in the country, you know, where there's fields and all of this, you think you're in, living with nature, but in reality, you're drinking atrazine. And then if you live in the city, you've got a lot of birth control. Yeah. So let's talk about EE2. <laughs> yeah. 17 control. Also, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we were talking a little bit at the very beginning about some of the health, some of the health problems from, uh, you know, these artificial estrogens and, and the list. If you look at the adverse reactions from birth control, it's the same type of problems that you find with all these other artificial. I mean, it's an artificial estrogen. Like I say, it's designed specifically to mimic estrogen. And you find the blood clotting, you find breast cancer increases, you find depression. And, you know, you, so you see all these problems, immune system dysfunctions, various forms, uh, you know, lower testosterone in the lab studies. You know, women don't usually pick that up as an adverse reaction, but it happens. You know, it's a reality. And the. Yeah, we need. To. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the crazy thing. Some of these labs, you, they test testosterone in women and they say like the normal range is between zero and whatever like 10 or 5 or 20 or whatever Zero, like I yeah. Think you don't need it. yeah no that's what they do i mean and it's nuts right but yeah so so a birth control i think the the issue is it's in the water when there's a lot of population density so you find studies that say oh it's not in the water but then you look at the study and it's done in iowa in the middle of nowhere right and it's like well yeah it's not in the water out there but if you actually look at the studies that are, you know, in population dense regions in Massachusetts, for example, they tested the river. It's called the Kushnet River. It was 700 times the European Union illegal allowable limit, the birth control. And believe me, that ends up in the water, the drinking water. And people can get that out. It's easy to get it out if you just use a charcoal filter. It's not like, you know, it's not like an uh, insurmountable problem. You just have to. You, you know, you have to recognize that it's important enough to filter pretty much all the water you're drinking with charcoal, not activated, char some kind of an activated charcoal Activate system. Them, yeah. yeah, that grabs out pretty much all these hormones. Yeah, so, so people are, are pretty much uh, self um, sterilizing themselves by taking EE2. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, the bigger problem is, like I say, the epigenetic problem, because a lot of times, you know, at least in the animal studies, because the animals, reach, you know, they have generations a lot more quickly. So mice, you know, you'll, you can in one year, they're, they're having babies and the next year they're having babies. And, you know, you can do studies on multiple generations. And with these animals, they're finding that, you know, well, let me backtrack for a second with with artificial estrogen. So the estrogen receptor, it acts on your DNA. That's one of the ways that it acts. It goes into the nucleus, acts directly on your DNA. So it shouldn't surprise anyone when we find that your epigenetics, which are marks on top of your DNA, your epigenetics get altered with virtually all these artificial estrogens, including birth control. And so, you know, so the reason that's important is because that gets passed to future generations. Right. And that's kind of the new news in science today is epigenetics are inherited and inheritable. And there's a lot of information your body stores there. It's not just infertility or obesity or whatever it's pretty much everything you do in your life gets stored in your epigenetic code right it's information and you know yeah we don't bear we barely understand how that works but i guarantee you there's thousands of epigenetic marks that get changed every time you're exposed to some artificial chemical or you're not exercising or you are exercising that you can positively impact your epigenetic code also you can you can have you can in you know you can create positive change and benefits but I mean, right now we're talking about artificial estrogens. And the, so going back to those animals, you know, these mice, they find a little bit of infertility. Yeah, a little bit in the first generation that are exposed to birth control, but it gets worse in the second generation. And it's even worse in the third generation. And this includes BPA and phthalates and these other chemicals, too, that we're, we're going to maybe add. But, you know, that's the crazy thing to me is it, it just from that one exposure, 
you see worse problems in future generations. Yeah, so you had a you mentioned a study in your book about uh, fish being exposed to um, estrogenics and seeing it. I think it was two yep. generations later where they were they had the same epigenetic changes as the first. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's and like I say, crazy. yeah. I mean, it, it the the generation like the fertility decreased as the generations went along. And, you know, there's there's also evidence I didn't talk about in my book. For example, smoking is another good example because mothers that smoke, their children have about a 1.5 fold increase in asthma. You know, and these obviously the children aren't smoking. They just get more asthma from the mother smoking. But here's the crazy thing. OK, so if your grandmother smoked, not your mother, your mother didn't smoke, but your grandmother did. You have a 1.8 fold increase uh, in asthma. It increases, you see? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that has to do with these, I think that's the problem. You know, we started off by talking about natural, you know, phytoestrogens and all these. At least our bodies have seen those, right? But these artificial ones, man, like we don't know what we're doing to ourselves in subsequent generations yet, but we're getting a little bit of a preview with some of these research studies now that we're looking at it. And it's not good. I mean, it's, it's essentially passing on problem bigger it's amplifying problems in future generations that's like I say your body is retaining that information that you're giving it wow that's ridiculous <laughs> yeah 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 so we're screwing our our future generations whether it's we're screwing yeah. up the environment or we're screwing up just our genetics or how our genetics are transcribed that's crazy that's right so let's yeah. talk about a yeah. few other um synthetic estrogenics like uh aquaphenols Alkalphenols, yeah, they're so that you find a lot of alkalphenols in soaps. And the unfortunate thing about those is they don't list them on the label. So it gets difficult if you just buy, buy the cheapest soap you can find. You don't usually find it in bar soap, it's usually in liquid soaps. But uh, yeah, in fact, on my consulting company page, you know, ajconsultingcompany.com, if you go ajconsultingcompany.com slash what I use, that's all in one word, what I use, you can literally go and look at what I use. I don't have any financial you know, ties to any of it. I don't get any money from any of it, all that. I just, it's just what I use, you know? And I, and yeah, there's, there's a hundred soaps that you can buy that are good, but I at least, I just tell people what I use, right? It's cheap. It's relatively <laughs> cheap. It's good. Use, yeah. yeah. And, and so people sometimes say, well, what about this? You know, why don't you use this? Why don't you, it's like, I don't know. It's like, I got a good one. I don't have a problem with it. Everything. I mean, there's other good ones out there, but I do look for soap that is alkyl phenol free because I don't trust most of the companies out there. And you don't have to list alkyl phenols on the label, and it is definitely estrogenic. So, what can you look for on the <laughs> label that would identify whether something has estrogenics in them? Well, triclosan is a big one because uh, you know you find that's antibacterial, but it's it's so it's not actual soap ingredient, but they add it to kill bacteria, and it's known to be extremely estrogenic. And they have to put that one on the label. And here's the crazy thing is next year, that's that's illegal in America. Right now, they made it illegal, but it do, it's still allowed for another year. So the, the actual regulation doesn't kick in until next year, but it's it's going to be illegal. Thank goodness, because triclosan because is triclosan is that we're nasty talking about. Stuff. <laughs> is it isn't it because I, they, they didn't find um, antibacterials to be beneficial in? That's probably true. Yeah, yeah I don't even know. Yeah, so I just looked at the regulations. I was like, well, at least they're making that one illegal. I don't but think yeah, it has anything to do with the estrogenic effects. <laughs> well, it's a bad one. I mean, in terms of yeah. it causes spontaneous abortions in mice, you know, and you expose them to triclosan. So, yeah, you know, you got to watch out That's with crazy. soap. I think in general, personal care products are overlooked. People think, you know, they think about their food a lot of times. Uh, they sometimes think about plastics like BP, especially BPA, but they don't think about their personal care products, like their soaps. And then the fragrances are another, that's another big one upcoming in a second. And those can have a huge health impact, yeah. All right, yeah, let's, let's talk about fragrances. <laughs> Good, yeah, so, well, it's crazy because obviously you find a lot of parabens in the fragrances. And I think people have some recognition of this because, you know, hopefully people are looking for paraben-free on the label. 
or just not using fragrance. That's generally what I do. But for women, that's a little bit, you know, that's more of a stretch to ask them to go fragrance free. And you don't have to, you just, you, but you do have to look for paraben free because they don't have to put it on the label. They hide it under the term fragrance. So you see fragrance on the label and the ingredient list, but that can pretty much mean anything because these companies, they have secret formulas and they don't want to reveal them. So they can, they're allowed to just put parabens, even phthalates, which is crazy to me. And both parabens and phthalates act like estrogen in your body. They're artificial estrogens. They're on my top 10 list for a reason. And the reason they put phthalates in there is because it carries the fragrance throughout the air a little bit farther. So, you know, you can smell somebody's perfume from a, a little bit Yeah, from like an extra foot or whatever. But and so people, you know, it seems crazy that they would put these in there. It's like, what are they trying to make people infertile? Or are they trying to make them fat? It's like, no, they're actually, the chemists are just thinking about the, the benefits of carrying the fragrance, right? Yeah. But, but in, and because it's legal, no, you know, everybody assumes it's okay. But you start looking at the artificial estrogen impacts on your body and, you know, you recognize that you got to avoid that stuff. So fragrance is a big one. Yeah, fragrance is awful. I, like, they'll, they'll put the same of these, some of these uh, similar um, things that you find in these body products and sunscreens exactly good point yeah the bp so benzophenone is another one on my list and four methyl benzylene and camphor four mbc so you get the fragrances in the sunscreen and you get some other artificial usually it's oxybenzone or benzophenone or something and yeah they're in like every sunscreen it's not i mean every cheap sunscreen you buy pretty much so and that's what you so what's what's you the got, problem with sunscreen other than blocking out vitamin d that we need or blocking out the the uv that we need to produce well, I, mean, I think the biggest one is definitely the artificial estrogen impacts because you know those are main ingredients in these products and you're rubbing it on your skin and they're going right through your skin into your blood and i mean it's a huge problem it's even an issue there scientists are even concerned about it in the air because they're putting it in plastics inside cars and other you know and other things because you know it protects against plastic being degraded from the sun so they're putting it in, you know, on your dash and all these plastics, and then, but it leaches out and then you get that new car smell or whatever. And, and scientists are starting to wake up and say, look, we're breathing these in, they're going right into your bloodstream too. And that's also a problem. So the new and car smell is actually just estrogen. It can be. <laughs> well, some of it, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, evolution, like if you think about it, you know, we have a natural inclination to be attracted to the estrogen smell, maybe subconsciously or maybe not, but you know, that's a natural kind of positive association that our brain you would you'd expect you would have right it shouldn't surprise anybody if that if that makes some kind of a positive you know brain signaling process you know po uh, whatever but if you've got artificial estrogens you can you know you can pervert that process and still stimulate maybe the same positive you know thoughts in your brain again you may not even be conscious of that but you know it's something people need to realize is that it, these artificial chemicals, even if they smell good, it doesn't mean they're good for your body because, you know, we haven't adapted the ability to kind of screen that. You know, we don't have taste buds for these things. We should, but we don't. I mean, they're totally artificial. Whereas at least with soy, right? So if you go out and eat some soybeans, trust me, you eat like 10 soybeans and you'll be like grossed out. You'll, you'll eat a few and you'll be like, okay, that's enough. You know, I had a few. Yeah. You, you usually don't eat a big, huge stack of them. Yeah, but you know, like, if you run it, enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if you process that soy and you you extract the oil with a bunch of chemicals and then you store it in plastics and all this other stuff, and then you drink it, you know, I mean, maybe maybe not drink it, but you know what I mean. Like your body is like, oh, that's no big deal, and you certainly don't taste the plastics. But you know, they're they're worse for you than the phytoestrogen, that's for sure. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, and the other thing about parabens, let me just jump in with the parabens because before yeah. we move on, uh, they're also used as uh, preservatives in food, especially like corn tortillas or something. You'll find methyl paraben, propyl paraben. You'll find the parabens because they kill bacteria because they're so, you know, they, they alter bacteria. And so you even have to watch your food in terms of the preservatives and, and make sure you're not eating some paraben preservative preservative that's crazy <laughs> that is very, that's absolutely ridiculous <laughs> yeah in fact uh I, I was just i i met with a professional hockey player about my you know about these artificial estrogens and he was actually from florida tampa bay and uh 
He, oh, cool. I, I brought a package of the, I actually went to the store on the way to the meeting and I got a package of corn tortillas and the, you know, it doesn't take long. You just walk into the store, you look on the label, methyl paraben, propyl paraben, butyl paraben, you got all these parabens and I checked out and left. And then when I go to the, I, I actually show people this tortilla package because it's powerful. I mean, it's like, look, artificial estrogen, why the heck is it in our food? But here it is, you know? And most people don't realize they're eating that stuff and it's having an impact. Yeah, it really does. So, yeah. uh, Oh, yeah. one thing yeah, I want to mention then, back, back with the, the sunscreen. So it's yep. on people. What happens to it when it, it hits the sun? Like what does UV do to it? Um, and then also being, you, you can find it in pools, right? It turns into... Yeah, well, people. Well, a lot of these personal care products are in swimming pools, right? So people are peeing out a lot of the parabens. They're peeing out a lot of the stuff, or it's coming off their cosmetics, right? From their shampoo, it's it's leaching into the pools. Yeah, and that's going through people's skin. But that's a great question. And um, the sunscreen estrogenics, you know, they when this then the ultraviolet hits that molecule, it changes the molecule, and it so. The thing I bring out in my book is when it when it's bound to the estrogen receptor, all right. So you've got benzophenone, and it binds to the estrogen receptor or four methylbenzylene camphor, which by the way, illegal in Europe, all right. And we're all slapping it on our skin all the time, especially where you are in Florida. Yeah, it's legal there. We put it on. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, when it binds the estrogen receptor, which it does, it looks like estrogen to your body. The the it clicks onto that estrogen receptor. When the sun hits that, it's likely it's not. Totally, sure. we're not totally sure, but I had a professional organic chemist tell me that it's very likely that that fuses to the estrogen receptor, which, you know, sounds kind of theoretical. But what that means is you're flipping the estrogen receptor in the on position, you know, permanently, essentially, until that receptor gets degraded or destroyed in some way. And that's not natural. Normally, these things bind and they come off. They bind and they come off kind of, you know, it just happens all the time. But if you're if you're literally locking it in place permanently with ultraviolet with these chemicals with these sunscreen chemicals that's kind of a unique thing that this and and like i say you're it's called constitutively active it's a constitutively active receptor which is a huge problem wow <laughs> that's crazy yeah i'm glad you i'm glad you brought it up I'm, you know <laughs> yeah I, I found that part <laughs> these kind of I, I saw, yeah i saw originally oh. in your book because you talked to that scientist and that, that's just ridiculous. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, wow. and, and I'm, I've done enough organic chemistry myself where I, I kind of knew that, but I, it was interesting to hear it from a professional organic chemist, somebody who literally for a living, he designs chemicals, you know, every day in a lab, he just sits down and says, okay, you know, like birth control, right? That's, that's the kind of stuff he makes, you know? So you sit there, I mean, he doesn't make birth control himself. I think he would probably consider that unethical, literally, but I mean, he's a friend of mine. Yeah. But, you know, you, what you do is you, like testosterone is another good example. These bodybuilders, they don't usually take normal testosterone. They, mo they buy stuff that's slightly modified so your liver doesn't break it down. So it stays in your body longer. And that way it doesn't get converted to estrogen, right? And that's one of the strategies. If you're an organic chemist, you sit there and you say, how do I design this molecule so that the liver, number one, the liver doesn't break it down. And number two, it doesn't get converted to estrogen or whatever, right? You sit there and you ponder this and you figure out which chemical groups or which angles to modify and how toxic that's going to be. You know, so these guys, they know what they're doing. Yeah. What about uh, bisphenols? So like BPA, that was huge in... The past couple of years that everything is now BPA free. Yeah. Yeah. They did a study in, I think, 2004, and they showed that over 90% of people in America are were exposed to BPA and it has massive future impacts. So you can be exposed as a as a baby to BPA and have future depression, future infertility issues. You know, you can have a lot of health problems in the future. So people say, well, I'm not exposed to BPA, right? I've, you know, I don't drink out of BPA, whatever. But you can still even have some health impacts from that today, especially if you if you continue to activate your estrogen receptor with our other artificial estrogens. But I think the big problem with BPA, it should be illegal, right? It's not, but it should be. And a lot of the states have made it illegal, at least in baby products. 
So I think 17 states have actually come out and made BPA illegal in baby food jars and because it's coating, you know, even though people don't, but they buy BPA free plastic bottles, it's still in the metal can. So if you buy metal canned food, it'll coat the inside of the metal cans. So a lot of people are still getting it from that. But, e but even when they make it illegal, they found that companies just switched to bisphenol S. They just changed to BPS, which is literally just as bad, if not worse, in terms of the estrogen activity. And if they, let's say they don't use BPA or BPS, they oftentimes will put phthalates in the plastic. So plastics are real iffy in general, even if it says BPA free. Wow. So they just took it and so they just took it found and a loophole and worked through that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's too bad because, you know, what can you do? If it says BPA free, you think you're good, but. Yeah. Well, one you're other not, estrogenic yeah. I want to talk about is uh, red food dyes and how that affects yeah. the body. Yeah, it's another one that they've tried to make illegal. It's been in front of the FDA about over 20 times, like 26 times. And scientists have proposed to make it illegal, but they just keep they just keep approving it. It just keeps going, you know. It's frustrating. In fact, they have made it illegal in uh, lipstick products, like some personal care products, but they still allow it in food, at least red number three. And red number 40 is just ubiquitously legal. And yeah, they activate the estrogen receptor. I mean, it's the same type types of health problems. And yeah, it's illegal in certain countries like Japan and some you know some other places. So and 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 it is legal. It is legal in Europe and the UK. Just so people know, but they have to put this huge warning if they. So you can use red. You can make red food coloring from beets, right? It's like beet extract, beet juice extract, extract. Perfectly healthy. Probably probably good for you, not bad for you. Yeah, as like a but certainly at least sort. yeah right at least neutral if anything right it's probably a nitric oxide you know like <laughs> enhancer or something yeah. but anyways uh, <laughs> artificial estrogens if you use those in Europe you have to put a big sticker on your it looks like a cigarette pack you have to put a big warning label that says it may cause health problems in children so obviously people don't use it I mean yeah it's legal over there. But, you know, nobody's going to do that when they can use, you know, beet extracts, which is what we should be doing in America. But look at your labels and you'll find red 40, you know, even in your soap sometimes. So, yeah, I tell people to avoid that. And even in the soap, it's probably a good thing to mention that when you're rubbing it all over your skin, even if you've got water washing that off, these hormones, these artificial estrogens, they act like hormones. They prefer to stay on your skin. They would they don't want to go into the water. Right. That's one of the chemical they're the properties of these yeah, things. Hydrophobic, right? Yeah. They prefer to hang onto your skin or on your clothing if you've got it in the laundry detergent and some of this stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it's a good thing to be aware of because we're getting I mean, frankly, we're getting bombarded with this stuff. <clears throat> it's just everywhere and they have compounding effects. Exactly. That's a great point. Yeah, they're ad it's additive. So if you have BP a little bit of BPA, a little bit of phthalate, a little bit of paraben, you know, you add those together and that's a bigger estrogen effect because they're all acting on the same receptor. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what are some things people can do to protect themselves? Obviously avoid uh, all these, but what, what can they do to, to essentially uh, detox their body, remove the bad things? What, what can they do to what like lifestyle uh, choices, food yep. choices, things like that? Yeah, well, we talked about omega-3, so DHA, supplement DHA for sure, <clears throat> because that seems to, ha it lowers them somehow. I don't understand how, nobody knows, but it definitely does. I talk about saunas in my book because that's a great strategy. Um, because again, these things do store inside your fat cells. So you can literally, you know, be holding on to these chemicals in your fat. And then when you try and lose weight, they actually, you know, get secreted into your bloodstream and promote weight gains. Right, so it's a vicious cycle where you're trying to lose weight, but you're secreting so these. You're intoxicating yourself. You're intoxicating yourself again. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, and and so you know, there's this kind of, <clears throat> there's this hump you got to get over when you're trying to lose weight, where you, you detox, you know, and you flush some of these chemicals out. Hopefully, like I say, using a sauna, using some intermittent fasting type strategies, which I don't, you know, I don't have like the perfect outline on how to do that based on each individual person. It varies, but. 
you know, there's a lot of good information out there about this stuff, and it helps a lot. It gets that stuff out of your fat cells. What is intermittent fasting doing? Uh, it, it helps to, number one, it increases autophagy, which is cellular, it, it's like your cells are cleaning up debris and cleaning, clearing it out. And then number two, it obviously burns fat. It causes your body to kick into, you know, ketosis and start burning fat, which shrinks your fat, you know, your fat cells. And that oftentimes dumps a lot of these uh, artificial estrogens into your blood, which at least allows them to be cleared rather than just you know, having them hanging out inside these fat cells for years, you know. And, and by the way, fat cells, they can live up to 10 years. You know, one single fat cell can literally, they've done these studies and they, the average life of a fat cell is a year and a half, but they can last 10 years, one fat cell. So you can hold on to this stuff, at least in theory, for 10 years inside a single fat cell. Wow. <laughs> so you can yeah. intoxicate yeah. yourself 10 years <laughs> later after your exposure. At least in theory. I mean, it's certainly within a couple of years and, and yeah, it's so it's an uphill battle. And but if people are aware of that, you know, it's it's it helps at least to have that recognition that, you know, this is going to be a little bit of a struggle at first and then it's going to get easier. And by the way, atrazine, I have a study that shows atrazine causes weight gains in rats. But they, and, and this is an interesting study and I bring it up because they gave the rats the exact same amount of calories. All right, so they had two groups of rats. They gave them the same exact food, same exact diet, but in one group they gave them low levels of atrazine in their drinking water, and the rats with the low levels of atrazine got fat. Just, and like I say, the same calories, which is important because people think, well, I'm counting my calories, so I'm okay. Well, not if you're eating artificial estrogens, and not if you're, you know, you gotta detox your body from these things. Get rid of the personal care products that have them. Stop eating them. And that is going to help people's weight loss for sure. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. So, so they've got sauna, DHA, ther or, uh, so thermogenesis, DHA. They've got lose weight. Um, what what are some other yeah. foods or lifestyle choices? Um, well, exercise obviously you know helps balance your hormones, <clears throat> and I mean, so so most of these things are pretty much you know common sense. I think the. I think the real... Oh, you mentioned active, activated charcoal before. Yeah, yeah, you can even take that as a pill. Yeah, and, and, and when, you're, <clears throat> when you're first starting these detoxes, you know, say you, you just have this awareness, this epiphany that, yeah, these artificial estrogens are bad and I'm consuming a lot of them. Well, you can encourage them to come out of your body by taking a good quality activated charcoal, you know, pill. Obviously, I'm assuming you're, you're purifying your drinking water. I mean, that should just be the basics. And that'll that'll definitely increase the speed at which they get out of your body. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, I mean, but I think I think the biggest thing for people is the avoidance. You know, I, you know. Yeah, well, I, I forgot to mention. What about the coffee? Yeah, you know, coffee. Coffee has that effect. Yeah, coffee is a big one because people they're heating it up. So I think the the thing about plastics, right, is heat will increase the molecular transfer of artificial estrogen into the liquid heat number another thing that will increase the molecular transfer is oil so if you've got something fatty or oil and in plastic you're going to have more artificial estrogen from from bpa or phthalates in the oil and the other thing that can do it is just having you know intramolecular variation like sugars or caffeine or other things so there's a study that showed that bpa uh, is in you know they had two mugs with coffee or probably a hundred of them but you know what i mean like the two different groups that they studied <clears throat> coffee mugs they all had bpa and then they just poured uh, decaf coffee or regular coffee right that's the two groups decaf and regular and they found that with regular coffee you had 20 percent more bpa transfer into the coffee if i'm remembering my numbers right you probably have the number in front of you. <laughs> I don't have the number, but I, I remember the study. Yeah, it's amazing, yeah. isn't it? I mean, just from the caffeine, that's the only difference between the two things. And that shows you how much, you know, these different molecules. So, you know, if you put, if you have a plastic water bottle, and by the way, they've done that study and they found that phthalates are over 1000 nanograms per liter in the plastic, in a grocery store plastic water bottle which is ridiculously high when you consider that your estrogen level is probably about 20 nanograms per liter. And women usually go between 20 and 400. So it's not like women are way up in the thousands anyway. So, you know, a plastic water bottle 
is is already got has over a thousand and then you add juice or something else with more you know complex sugars or you know other molecules and you start increasing the rate of transfer out of that substance that's crazy <laughs> yeah what, one thing i want to i want to end on is a lot of these studies you go through the studies and they're constantly conflicting you'll you'll yeah. see that some of them are saying that these estrogenics are bad. Some of them are saying that, oh, we found really no harm. Uh, or some of these, like, we found no conclusion. What's what's going on there? <clears throat> so the, yeah, so the public's well, aware of what's actually going on. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's a big can of worms to end on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's definitely some, there's a lot of aspects. Uh, number one, I think the biggest one, <sighs> is 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 bias so there's some bias there's corporate spin and i'll just give you an example of of how bad this problem is this bias problem this corporate influence i mean let's say you sell birth control or you sell soy products or even grains or whatever yeah you can actually rig the scientific studies to make them more positive about your substance than they than they really are in reality by kind of overblowing some aspect and kind of underplaying every other aspect and people you know if if they don't believe me, the the the, cla the the most important thing to know is that Marcia Angel, that's two L's on the end of Angel. Angel, she she was the uh, New England Journal of Medicine chief editor for over twenty years, and she literally stepped down because there's so much corporate influence on the scientific research, just within the New England Journal, where companies are essentially sponsoring studies, and yeah, of course they're finding positive benefits for their products. You know, that doesn't mean the products are healthy. But that stuff is saturating the scientific literature. So you either need a scientist that you can trust to in, to kind of uh, interpret this, or you have to go through it yourself. And but just recognize that there's probably bias yes, when there's products to be sold. How they can construct it, what the controls are, everything. Yep. 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 And even even well intentioned studies, oftentimes, I mean, there's always going to be flaws. And the other problem is, you know, there's oftentimes uh, problems with re rep you know, replication. So when, when one group does something and they publish it and then a different group comes along, apparently there's a study at Bayer that was done and it showed that 75% of the time they could not replicate studies that were published in peer reviewed journals. And I, I found that to be true myself. I've talked to a lot of other scientists that say that's the same, you know, at least 50%. And so that's a big problem too. Even, even assuming that even pretending that bias didn't actually happen like these corporate yeah. you know biases that i was talking about there's a there's a problem with the the repeatability of a lot of these experiments yeah it's awful, it's awful. <laughs> well so that's that's why i think i think people have to you know if if you're thinking about it in terms of these artificial estrogens acting on the estrogen receptor as kind of a big picture right you just you know like you look at bpa and the problems with that and you find that a lot of those same problems with birth control and a lot of the same problems with phthalates and a lot of, the, you know, and you start adding the, all that evidence together. And then you recognize the problem is that they're acting on the estrogen receptor in an unnatural way. And that's, like I say, the pattern. You got to look for the pattern. Yeah, and that, the pattern that's the way is the way destruction to of the uh, estrogen receptor. And then you can pretty yep. much relate uh, yep. all the estrogenics and how they yep. can work on the body. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's it, man. <laughs> All right, awesome. This, this was awesome. Thank you for, uh, coming on. I know we had a, a mess up in communication yesterday, but today it worked out really right? well. Uh, how can people contact you or find out more about you? So my nonprofit is, is for international medical students. So most people in the United States, it's better if they check out my, uh, AJ consulting company. Uh, and that's like I say, AJ consulting company.com. I'm on Twitter at AJCCO underscore com because they don't let me use dot com. You can just type in, people can just type AJCCO dot com. Also, that gets you to AJ Consulting Company. And, you know, I like I say, I have a YouTube channel. I'm coming out with videos every week. They're just short videos, but I'm oh, kind oh, of, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm trying to interpret some of the science for people to make it simpler. That's the idea. And, and that's the thing with my book, too, is I want to emphasize that I, I really tried to simplify the science. It's not written for PhD scientists or even super nerds like yourself. It's written for normal people. I mean, that was kind of the goal. <laughs> uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And there, there was enough in there sure. to, to, to enjoy uh, from the scientific aspect as well. Yeah, yeah. thanks. So Appreciate it. Check out his book. I, I've got it on my phone, Astro Generation. Nice. 
Uh, nice. It was amazing. And if you can get a, uh, the audio version as well, uh, the passion he puts into it is also fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Appreciate All it. Right. It's the first Thank time. For coming first time on. I've done. It was, uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah.